Central Time, so that would be nine o'clock uh, your time, right? Okay, yeah, that that sounds fantastic. Looking forward to it. Right on. It's, we're going to have a good time, I believe. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing about your uh, Catalina Island experience in Catalina. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting dynamics about Catalina Island. I'm sure you're aware of that. So, yeah, absolutely. We will have a good time tonight. Amen. Uh, Rick, um, you're saying turn off the show in the background if you could. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm just listening to the voice on the on the computer. Is it okay now, Rick? I'm talking to my producer, Randall. Give me a second. And he's not answering. I guess we're okay. I guess we're live, Randall. I'm looking forward to it. And right. uh, tell people how they can listen to the show this evening. Sure, there's a couple of ways you can listen. You can go over to diffusionofthedelusion.com. There's a player and chat room embedded on the website there. You can also access the audio at gwileradio.com. Uh, we stream 24-7, 365, so this is just one, something we do every night. So uh, you should be able to find us pretty easy. Just go to gwile.com or go to diffusionofthedelusion.com. Great. Well, listen, we're, we're, we're excited. I'm excited about being on your show, and... Uh, let me get back to my show here. Thanks for doing the little cameo. Sure. Got nope. a zillion, zillion questions in, in the queue here, and I'm trying to get to them. But um, I'll see you in a few hours, and we'll go from there. All right. God bless you, brother. Talk to All you right. later. You too. Take care. So I will be on the Rando's show, uh, Diffusion of a Delusion Radio, uh, this evening. I think that's 9 o'clock my time. And uh, looking forward to that. That's going to be good. Okay. This is from Glenda. And she writes, Mr. Marjuli, I watch you on Prophecy of the News as you discuss the red-headed giants. Let me start by stating, I have a manuscript that I am writing about the vision that the Lord has given me. I must admit that the answers or interpretations to these visions don't come as soon as I would like. But I think your discussion has made one of these visions clearer for me. I saw a red-haired child who looked deformed in what I thought was heaven. This bothered me for years, since about 2006. I would hesitate to think that a deformed child would be in heaven. At any rate, I asked a question about this child because her red hair was a color that I had not seen here on earth. A voice answered me and said, she is unborn. I thought this meant that the child was aborted and was not allowed to live on earth. After seeing you on the television, I'm beginning to think I saw a demon. My question is this, do you have any information or books that I may read and learn more about these red-headed giants slash demons? In addition to this one, I have seen many more along with the ones that the History Channel is calling aliens. I'm extremely glad to see you and others call them what they are. They are all demons. I don't know why. I have seen all the visions that I have, including a vision of how the rapture will occur. Well, let's just stop there, folks. This is all uh, fairly controversial and um, very, very interesting stuff. And I realize there, there, are, tired, there are people um, who... We'll listen to that and go, well, you know, why is she seeing visions and all this other stuff? But we're told that, uh, biblically, that uh, people, specifically in the last days, will see visions and dream dreams. So I don't understand why the uh, the confusion there. But um, here, here's the deal, Glenn, in, in my opinion. Um, first of all, the, the whole thing with the red hair is bizarre. Um and that doesn't mean people with red hair today are Nephilim. So let's not even go there. But we know that something happened because the skulls that we examined in Paracas seemingly had red hair. We are in the process of trying to get hair samples taken out of the country legitimately so we can do uh, testing on the hair, find out uh, carbon-14 dating, if the hair is genuinely red or it's henna, in other words, died, we need to find out. We did take one hair out of Peru uh, from a that just fell off a mummy. It was not attached to the scalp. It just was a hair. And Senior Juan of the Paracas History Museum allowed to take that. That is in the upcoming book, Armatrail of a Nephilim, Volume 2. And what we found there uh, with Stephen Colburn, who, was a, who is a scientist who ran Raman spectroscopy, uh, with the hair, and he had four samples of hair. He had a human hair, normal human hair, undyed. Then he had, second sample was a uh, human hair that was dyed. Uh, the third sample was um, the red hair from Paracas, and the fourth sample was a white hair that had been given to him from a man who had been abducted by a hybrid being, and forced to have sex with her. Now, I realize that is incredibly bizarre. I get it. And for those of you who are listening, 
you know, L.A., where's the proof? You know, this is all hearsay. Why does this matter? Blah, blah, blah. First of all, it does matter. And I'll tell you why it matters. There may be people in your congregation who have been abducted and are afraid to talk about it because of the shame, because they think no one will believe them. Second of all, we are told in Scripture that it would be like the days of Noah when Jesus returns. And that begs the question, what, what are the days of Noah really like? And this is why the, the interpretation, in my opinion, of Genesis 6 is so important. Genesis 6 talks about the fallen angelic beings coming to earth, having sex with the women. And I realize a very controversial passage, but the sons of God, Benai uh, Elohim, always refers to the angelic host. You can go and elsewhere in the Bible and see where this phrase in Hebrew that I just said, Benai Elohim, uh, is used, and it's used in Job, and it always refers to the host of heaven. So how uh, some so-called biblical scholars, with all due respect, get the godly line of, of Seth out of this is, is torturing the text, as my late mentor, Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, would say. Nowhere does it talk about the sons of Seth in that text. That came, that interpretation is called the Sethite view. It comes in much later, about the fourth century. Uh, many of the rabbis that I've talked to believe, as I do, that these were the fallen angels. Josephus and other extra biblical texts also talk about these fallen angelic beings having sex with the women. And the progeny, of course, is the Nephilim. So we are told to be like the days of Noah. And the question is, are we seeing something manifest like this? And, of course, in my opinion, yeah, we are. What's manifesting is people are being abducted and forced to have sex with these hybrid beings. These are not hybrid beings from Zeta Reticula. These are, in my opinion, what you would call modern-day Nephilim. They are hybrid beings. And we took the white hair from this, this hybrid female. When this man was forced to have sex with this hybrid female, he awakened the next morning and found several of these hairs on his person, on his body. He had the presence of mind to take it. And this is what was examined with Raman spectroscopy. Now, there is several researchers or several, actually, they're, 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 they're just people that got blogs with all due respect, and they've tried to poo-poo this research. Well, you know, before you do that and tell us that we're all full of horse pucky, why don't you get your own hair samples and prove us wrong? Of course, they don't do that. They never go anywhere in the field. They just sit in their basements or in their offices and write hit pieces on people like me and Chuck Missler and Tom Horn and others. And Gary Stearman, he's also included in there. Uh, and other people. Doug Hamp is, is one of their favorites. Uh, you know, why not um, do your own research before you shoot down the Raman spectroscopy? Um, have you actually been to a lab where Raman spectroscopy was used? Or are you just going online and reading about it and then telling us that, that the research that was done is somehow skewed because you say it is? Well, why should we believe what you have to say? Just because you have a PhD after your name, uh, does that really mean that you know all things? I think it's a very arrogant position. Uh, and I always preface it by saying, look, folks, I don't have all the answers. I'm just telling you what we did. And we took the four hairs and we gave them to a scientist and he looked at them all under Raman spectroscopy. He used Raman spectroscopy and it all, the Raman spectroscopy prints the results out on a graph and he showed me the graph. So what am I supposed to think from this? The human hair comes in and the slope is, is sort of a nice little gentle curve and it goes away. But dyed human hair comes in on the left side and shoots up off the top of the graph. The red hair from the Peruvian mummy, which is about 2,000 years old, we estimate, and the white hair from the hybrid being, alleged hybrid being, the slopes of these two track almost identically. So what are we supposed to think of that? Look, I have a hypothesis that I'm working on in On the Trail of a Nephilim 1 and in Volume 2 and in Volume 3. It's an ongoing research. My hypothesis is, is, is basically using the scientific method, and it's basically this. If the Nephilim were on the planet in the time that Joshua and Caleb went into the Levant or the Promised Land, which later becomes Israel, 
And if these giants were there, as Josephus says, and as the Bible plainly states in Numbers 13, and remember when Moses is discussing and writing all this down, it's hundreds of years after the flood. And so Moses writes, the Nephilim were on the earth and also afterward. Why would he write that? Hundreds of years after the flood. He wouldn't write that. He would only say the Nephilim were on the earth and put a period there. Because that's it. There is no afterward. But he's writing from a period of hundreds of years after the event of the flood, after the event of Genesis 6. And so he's saying the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. So the hypothesis that we're working on is that these Nephilim tribes, the Zanzumim, the Emims, they're all listed there, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, left the Levant, fled the Levant. There was a diaspora from the Levant, from the Promised Land. We believe, our hypothesis is, that some fled northward through Europe. Others fled out through the Red Sea. Others fled out through the Mediterranean, and they inhabited different parts of the earth. Look, the Paracas people show up in Paracas about 3,500 years ago, which fits the timeline of the conquest of the Levant. The preliminary DNA testing, which was taken out by Lloyd Pye years before I ever got there, and it was released by a geneticist, and I am, I am in contact with the geneticist, and this is why we're trying to get the nine samples out of Peru, to test and show what the DNA evidence really is. But the preliminary DNA evidence that this man, uh, and I spoke to him on the phone multiple times and emailed him multiple times. He's got no Nephilim dog in the hunt, folks. He's saying that segments of the microchondrial DNA do not match anything in the genome. Whether in Neanderthal or Denisovan, it's something completely different. That fits our hypothesis. Is it conclusive? Of course it's not. And that's why I'm going on the record now. But don't, you know, don't write hit pieces on us because we're out there in the field actually doing real research with real hair samples and we're, and we're publishing what we're getting. It's not peer reviewed, but, you know, there it is. You can look at it. When we get the samples out, it will be peer reviewed. Something's going on, and right now it fits our hypothesis. And if we're wrong, we'll admit it. It's just like the Catalina skeleton. It fits the hypothesis. There's an eight-and-a-half-footer that's found in Catalina. That fits the hypothesis of giants being in the Americas. Native Americans talk about giants. How many people have some of these detractors actually spoken to that are elders in Native American tribes? How many? But they sit and they write their little hit pieces and try to tell everyone that people like Chuck Missler and Tom Horn and Gary Stearman and myself and others are all crazy. Frankly, folks, I think they protest too much. And you'll notice that I never mention them here because I won't give them a platform won't give them a platform. Meanwhile, I'm out in the field. I was out in the field last week. I'll just I'll, I'll throw you a little a little something because it'll be on the trail in, in on uh, on the trail volume three. There was a place um, that we were at that had these flint pits, and flint this flint was of highly uh, a very high grade of flint. I actually saw the flint prints flint pits. I walked around them, walked in them. And in these flint pits, the Native Americans would use a maul, another rock, an igneous rock, very hard. And they would throw that rock onto the flint and break the flint up into smaller pieces, 20, 30, 40 pounds. They would take that flint and take that off. And then from that, they would chip away and make their arrowheads and knife points and spearheads, okay? Okay. Well, there was a gentleman that we had the privilege of meeting who had bought five acres in this particular location and was going over the flint pits and collecting flint for his, uh, his own. He makes, he makes uh, replicas. Some of these replicas sell for 
as high as $10,000.